Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray, amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning, I'm going to be reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 15, and I'll be reading verses 9 through 15. And Jesus is speaking to his disciples, and this is what he says. He says, I loved you as the Father loved me. Now remain in my love. I have obeyed my Father's commands, and I have remained in his love. In the same way, if you obey my commands, you will remain in my love. I have told you these things so that you can have the same joy I have, so that your joy will be the fullest possible joy. This is my command. Love each other as I have loved you. The greatest love a person can show is to die for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I call you friends because I have made known to you everything I have heard from my father. Pray with me. Jesus, we need this day. May we celebrate in it and experience your presence and be transformed by it. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. It was about 110 years ago, I was pastor of a little church, kind of out in the middle of nowhere. And once a month, we had what we called administrative board, that administrative leaders from each of the main committees would come together and we'd meet together once a month. Well, I got to the meeting a little bit early and there was a faint smell of something in the air. I couldn't tell what it was. I just knew it wasn't good. And as other people were coming in, they noticed the, the faint smell too. And that's when it hit me. There had been a, a cat for several weeks that had been hanging around the church. It wouldn't let anybody get near it. It didn't look too good. Um, but I hadn't seen the cat in about two or three days. And that was my thinking. It was a dead cat under the church. Well, the chair of the administrative board started off the meeting. Let's take care of first things first. Trustees, if you all will take care of the dead cat from under the church, that'd be great. Well, <laughs> the chair of the trustees was surprised by it. She was pretty sure she wasn't going to be the one to crawl under the church and get a dead cat. So she was also sure that her husband wasn't going to do it, and she was sure they didn't have enough money in their account to pay someone to do it. So being the clever person that she was, she said, well, that cat hung around the church for a long time. It was really more like staff. Really. It was the church cat. It was staff. And so I proposed that the personnel committee take care of the problem. <laughs> Everybody just laughed and laughed. thought it was really funny, and it was, except that the chair of the personnel committee, he didn't laugh at all. He said, well, I, I can see how you might say that this was the, the church cat and a member of the staff. But once that cat died, I think now it's the responsibility of the cemetery committee. And we need to provide the honor of a funeral for this cat. And the cemetery committee needs to take care of it. Well, everybody just laughed and laughed. And it was pretty funny. But there, right in the same meeting, that cat changed status from a problem to be solved to an honored member of the church. Change of status. Change of status. <laughs> it, it can happen quickly. And a change of status, well, you know, it often means privilege. But it also means a change in practice. When my children turned 13 years old, 
they were very aware there was a change in status. They, they, now, they were now teenagers. They had looked up to teenagers for a long time, and now they were one. They wanted a, an increase in responsibility, an increase in allowance. They wanted an, an increase, a little more, a little more, but, you know, with a change in status became a change in practice, too. That responsibility required a change in practice as a teenager. Well, I remember the first time that I was ever referred to as Gina's husband. I liked it. Liked it then, like it now. There's a, a, a change of status. That there's a, a relationship there. Privilege there. It's wonderful. Being described as, and, and, and identified as Gina's husband. But there's also comes a change in, in practice. I don't know if you remember the first time you held your child in your hands. I, I remember it really well. I looked into the face of my son and I, I, couldn't, I couldn't believe that my parents loved me that much. That I had a change in status. I was now a father. And as a father, that required a change in practice. Change in practice. This morning... Jesus is talking, it's the last night of his earthly life. He's called his disciples together in an upper room, and he's telling them that he's going to die. But he will not leave them alone. He won't leave them as orphans, is what he says. That because he's going to die, that he'll rise again. You know, he'll send the Holy Spirit as helper. Some Bibles translate it as advocate. Some translate it as comforter. But they won't be left in, alone. That the, the power of his Holy Spirit will be sent to them after he's crucified and rises from the grave. Well, the disciples don't understand this. And so he goes on to explain that they'll have a, a change in status. And that's what we read about this morning. Verse 15, I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know what his, friends, his master is doing. But I call you friends. Friends. Huge change in status that at first reason, reading we might not understand, but there are about only two people in the entire Bible that have been called friend of God Abraham and Moses. And now, and now you and I, the followers of Jesus Christ, have been put in the same category as Abraham and Moses, the same status, friend of God, as Abraham and Moses. And with that change in status becomes change in, well, in privilege and in practice. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. The change in status, well, it brings with it a, a, a change in, in practice. And the first thing that I want to invite you to do is, is, is practice love. Verse 9, this is what Jesus says, I loved you as the Father loved me, now remain in my love. To remain in my love means to practice and let stay in my love. It's not a, a feeling. It, he's not talking about a feeling at all. He's talking about a response. A response that we practice as friends. As friends of God. There's a story that helps me out here. It's a story from 2 Samuel chapter 9. story of Mephibosheth. I don't know if you rem remember the story of Mephibosheth. Uh, it it kind of sticks out there in, in, in an unusual place there in 2 Samuel that, you know, one of the changes that I see going around nowadays, is there are a lot of folks out there that are naming their children after Old Testament characters, Old Testament folks, and I'd, but I haven't heard any Mephibosheth names out there being thrown around, and there's a good reason why. It's because the name means shameful thing. Nobody wants to name their child shameful thing. And Mephibosheth, quite frankly, is a mouthful. And this is a story where King David, he's sitting in his throne, and, and, it, and it opens up that David wants to show kindness, a gratitude to someone in the house of Saul. He says, is there anyone in the house of Saul that I might show kindness to for Jonathan's sake? Well, this is, this is really a gracious, gracious thing. 
Not just that he wants to show kindness to somebody, but to the house of Saul. Saul was the king before David, and Saul wanted to kill David. It was only Saul's son, Jonathan, that warned David and saved his life. Well, in gratitude of that, David wants to show a kindness to someone, anyone that was of the house and family of Saul. So they bring to him a servant that was Saul's servant, Seba. Seba says, well, there was this, this one child, one child of, of, of Jonathan that's still around. Well, Jonathan and David were best friends. How did he not know about the child? Well, that's when Seba goes on to say, the child was Mephibosheth or shameful thing. And this child was dropped by the nurse when he was born. So he wasn't good for the army. He wasn't good for going out and helping in the fields. Wasn't really any good for helping around at the house. So they did what was the custom at the time, and they, they gave him into slavery. For his, in exchange for his room and board, he was made a slave at a place called Lodabar. And Lodabar means place of no pasture. Here's the thing of shame in a place of no pasture, way out in the boondocks. And David calls him to show a kindness to him. And the first thing that Mephibosheth does, he's, he's certain that he's in some kind of trouble. And so he throws himself down before David and he says, Who am I, a dead dog, that you show regard for me? That he saw himself as nothing more than a dead dog. But David calls him up, calls him up. Four times he tells him that he'll eat at the king's table regularly. And not only that, he gives him the land and the possessions that belonged to his father and to his grandfather. It wasn't because of what Mephibosheth had done. It wasn't because of what he deserved. It was a grace shown by David. It's what he chose to do, a love shown by David. So often we think that, that as, a, as a friend of God that, 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 that we're supposed to conjure up feelings, but that's not the case at all. It's God who's moved us from being a shameful thing, that on the cross when Jesus gave his life for you and for me, he moved us from, from the status of a shameful thing to being a friend of God, from the status of, of having a place of no pasture to being welcomed to the king's table. From a life with no meaning, of being equal to a dead dog, to the life of a new creation, an abundant life, a life that has the quality of eternity that starts right now as a friend of God. And this is the same love that we show to others, not because of what they deserved or they earned or that they've been so loving to us, we'll love them back but even when they haven't been lovable. And that we remain in that love, that we practice that love. That's what friends of God do. Friends of God practice love. But the second thing I want to talk about this morning is I want to invite you to, to practice joy. Verse 11, Jesus says, I've told you these things so that you can have the same joy I have and so that your joy will be the fullest possible joy. That we won't just have a little sprinkle of joy, that our joy might be full. The fullest possible joy is what it says. Story that helps me here. In the Old Testament, God spoke to Moses, told him, go tell Pharaoh to let my people go that they may celebrate me in the wilderness. Celebrate me in the wilderness. That God's intention for his people is to celebrate, to practice joy, to practice praise, to celebrate, to practice giving thanks, to practice giving honor. That his people had had a, a lifetime of practicing, not joy, but they'd had a lifetime of practicing anguish, slavery, of bitterness, and now God's offering what he, he's, he's always desired for, for his people, a life that, that practices joy. 
Dan Rather tells a story about growing up in Bloomington, Texas. When he was a little boy, he says that they, they had a, a, a revival come to town and spread out a big tent. And there were, One night, he and his grandparents went, sat on a wooden bench there at the revival. Said the revival pe- preacher had, had gotten into a fervor. And then he, in the middle of his sermon, he reached back into a box and he pulled out two live snakes and threw them onto the, the congregation. He said the people didn't know whether the snakes were poisonous or not, and they didn't stick around to check. They just ran out the, the doors of the tent. That he, he thought maybe he'd shake up people a little bit that way, and that, and that he would, he then chastised them for having a lack of faith. And sometimes we get to thinking the only way to shake folks up is by fear or danger or outrage. And we live in a world that lives on a steady diet of fear and danger and outrage. But friends of God, friends of God, we're called to something different. We're called to a life of joy, a life of practicing joy, the fullest possible joy. We're called to a life of practicing not only joy but praise and honor and and giving thanks. And it requires practice in this world. And you really want to shake folks up? You really want to shake folks up? Practice joy. Practice joy. This pandemic has been hard on a lot of folks. They need to see what friends of God look like. They need to see the practices of friends of God. Practice, not of fear. Not of danger, not of outrage, but of joy. We've been invited, invited to practice joy. We've been invited to practice love. And the last thing that I want to talk about this morning, I want to invite you to practice obedience. Practice obedience. Verse 14, this is what Jesus says. He says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. That's straight to the point, isn't it? That it obedience is expected i think something's kind of crept into churches that you know this christian life is is all about the feelings and we can pretty much do what we want and god will excuse any disobedience well yes forgiveness is available to you and to me but obedience is expected obedience is expected when i was growing up my grandmother lived with us for a while and my grandmother was very Baptist. She was very, very Baptist. My grandmother was very, very, very Baptist. As a matter of fact, she was so Baptist. She was from a, a, a small middle Georgia town. And uh, whenever I met anyone from her town, my grandmother had an unusual name. Her name was Jack Cooper. And not many women named Jack Cooper, especially in a, a, a small middle Georgia town. And when I would ask him, do you or no Jack Cooper, the response was always the same. She was a member of the Baptist church, wasn't she? (laughs) That was how she was identified. Well, my grandmother told the story about being baptized as a little girl. She was very afraid of the water. And she told the preacher how uneasy she was with the the water and her whole face going down into the water that the whole thing just scared her a lot. Well, the Baptist preacher, being sympathetic, when he baptized her, he dunked her into the water, but he left her nose out. And so my grandmother used to joke she was 99% Christian. Her nose, she wasn't sure about that. (laughs) Well, it was pretty funny. But then I got to thinking, you know, I think we'd all like to hold back a little something, wouldn't we? And thinking that, well, 99% Christian, 99% obedient, that's good enough. And that we want to hold back. Hold back maybe, maybe a behavior. And then we excuse it by saying, well, well, this is just me. Or maybe we hold back a part of our lives saying, well, this is my school life. Or this is my, my work life. Or, or my family just knows the way that I am. And we hold back from giving it to God. The good news is that the transformation, the change, the new life 
of a friend of God, it's not dependent on us. It's the power of His Holy Spirit, the risen Christ, that lives through us, that gives us strength we don't have. Romans 8, 26 says, in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness. This morning, there may be a part of your life that you've been holding back. Maybe a behavior. Or maybe a a place that you've been holding back. Or maybe it's an attitude, or maybe it's a person. Someone that you think, well, God will understand if, if I don't love them. God will understand if, if I don't accept them. And that you haven't asked for God's help, God's strength. I want to pray with you now. Join with me in prayer. Jesus, it's your strength, the power of the risen Christ, your Holy Spirit, that we need most to practice, to practice obedience. As your friends, it's what you you desire, it's what you expect, and it's what you give us power to do. I ask that you breathe your Spirit into into those... In that place in our lives, maybe that we've been trying to withhold from you. A place that we've tried to call mine rather than share it with you. Lord, it may be that, that during this pandemic that we've been withholding joy from you. That rather than as a friend of God practicing joy, praise, rather than practicing celebration, We've been listening to voices that have tried to get us to practice fear and anger and outrage. And we've been caught up not in being your friends. We need your strength in our weakness. Strength that will transform us. Shake us up with joy. A joy that's the fullest possible joy. Lord, it may be that um, we have, have not received your love. We thought it was something that we had to work for, something we deserve, something that we earn. And we've not come to your table as your friend. Instead, we've, we've wanted to come as your servants, even though that you call us friend. Starting this day. Breathe into us the power of your Spirit that we might have strength enough, strength enough to come in grace, to come in love, and responding as a friend to your table, to put aside the shameful thing, to put aside that place of no pasture, and to freely come to your table. Lord, may this day be a day of transformation of change because your spirit breathes through us it's in Christ's name we pray amen thanks again for joining us today Um, just a reminder if you'd like to watch the entire worship service you can do so via live stream at nine o'clock at 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, Thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're a church that's a place of community and faith and we're a welcoming church. I hope that you experience that online, but not only online, my hope is that you experience it through our Facebook page. 
But not only that, once we meet together in person, we're at 814 Mimosa Boulevard, and I hope you'll come and experience it in person. We're a welcoming church. We're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. It's a place of community and faith where we help people live a Christ-centered life. And my hope is that you'll come and be a part of it. Thank you for joining us.